Are you, are you rolling? Hmm, this is the um, third presentation at the British Columbian Camp 1984. This is the Sabbath morning study period at 11 o'clock. 11, 20, 20 more exact. Let's come back now to a further consideration of the problems which developed back in 1844 and their far-reaching effects in Adventist church history and the effect in turn that they have upon our own history at the present time. Now as usual of course there are some difficult statements that um, emerge in regard to these problems and which have to be understood as we learn to understand the character of God, namely that we take the way in which the Lord meant these words to be understood rather than the usual way in which we understand ourselves. I'll turn now to page 405 in the book Great Controversy and bearing in mind that uh, there's a parallel being drawn between the experience of the folk back in Christ's day and the 1844 movement, we'll read these words as follows. First of all in regard to the disciples, 500 years before, the Lord had declared by the prophet Zechariah, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king comes to thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon the a colt to follow an ass. Zechariah 9, verse 9. Now there's the prophecy made um, in Zechariah. Now comes Sister White's comment. Had the disciples realized that Christ was going to judgment and to death, they could not have fulfilled this prophecy. In other words, for them to fulfill that prophecy required that they be ignorant of the true nature of Christ's mission. And you get the impression, an erroneous impression, to say the least of it, of course, that God therefore um, organized things so that those men did not understand so the prophecy could be fulfilled which seems rather a contradiction to God's effort, his manifest effort to Jesus Christ to achieve the very opposite, namely the full revelation to those men of what the mission of Christ would lead him to, namely to crucifix them to death. We read in our last study period, for instance, that uh, Christ began to show his disciples in that time forward what his future was going to be. We read how that if his words had been heeded as God planned they should be, that those men would not have suffered disappointment, but would, would have understandingly have followed right through all the events of that tragic weekend. And yet here we find that uh, in order for them to fulfill this prophecy, they had to be ignorant of the actual events to take place. Now, <clears throat> the question arises, does God write prophecy as a manipulation of the future or as a prediction of what's going to happen? And we know what the answer is, of course. The prophecy is written in the light of what was going to take place. And God foreknew that despite his best efforts, those men would continue to retain their erroneous views in regard to Christ's mission. And, from, and therefore, the prophecy is written in view of that inexcusable ignorance. I'd like to just read a paragraph from the Messenger magazine, page 9, January 1984. Did God give this prophecy in Zechariah because he intended to make the future what it ended up being or because he foreknew that it would work out that way despite his best efforts to prevent it? We know what the answer is, don't we? We know that God did not write the prophecy to make the future what he intended to be but because he foreknew what, what, what was going to happen. Ask the same question saying another area of prophecy. God's word prophesied that at the end of the world there will be a class of people called the wicked who will persecute God's people and, and later perish eternally. Is God by the power of his word forcing a certain group to be wicked and perish or is he simply telling us what he foresees will happen? Does God put forth effort to save all people or does he withhold his blessings from some in order to make sure that his word comes true? For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God who desires all men to be saved and it comes to the knowledge of the truth. So it's very, very clear then that what God wrote in Zechariah was a prediction of what was going to be, not a prediction of what he was going to make to be. Then Sister Weiss says on page 405, in like manner, in the same way precisely, 
Miller and his associates fulfilled prophecy and gave a message which inspiration had foretold should be given to the world and which they could not have given had they fully understood the prophecies, pointing out their disappointment and presenting another message to be preached to all nations before the Lord should come. The first and second angel messages were given at the right time and accomplished the work which God designed to, to accomplish by them. And note those three words, in like manner. In other words, exactly as the disciples gave a message despite God's efforts to save them from doing so, which they could not have given had they understood Christ's true mission. So in like manner, the Millerites did the same thing. We've already seen, of course, that had the, the, the disciples fully accepted the messages which Christ had for them, it would have been different. They could never have given that message. And therefore, God would have written prophecy differently. And we've already seen how God tried so hard in the 1844 period to prevent the disappointment by sending a prophet in the person of uh, William Foy and a second one in the person of Hayson Foss, although Hayson Foss came after the disappointment. So really the one prophet, William Foy, was sent to, to enlighten the Adventist mind so they would come up to the great day of atonement knowing what was going to happen and it was not the second coming of Jesus Christ. So that difficult statement seems to be difficult when we understand that simple principle as uh, as put there. <clears throat> now, moving on to another difficult statement, uh, this one from the early writings 235 and 236. It says, I saw the people of God joyful in expectation, looking for their Lord, but God designed to prove them. His hand covered a mistake in the reckoning of the prophetic periods. Again they were led to their Bibles to search the prophetic periods. The hand of the Lord was removed from the figures and the mistake was explained. They saw, they saw that the prophetic periods reached to 1844. Now that appears to tell us that God deliberately held his hand over the important parts of the prophecy, that God himself organized the mistake that God is the one responsible for their ignorance and that the consequent results were also that what he specifically designed would happen at that point of time. Now we recognize, of course, if God behaved that way, it was in very direct contradiction to his character, very direct contradiction. It means he did tempt those people deliberately. He did deliberately cause the great shaking. He did deliberately cover up the truth from them, whereas the evidence shows he didn't do that but made every effort to make the message plain to them. Now let's um, relate this to the message on, on Does God Destroy? And again I'll read from the Messenger magazine a paragraph or two to make the point. When the word cover is used we are willing to believe and accept its use but we must do it according to God's ways and definitions which are not the same as man's. So what does God mean when he says that he covered an error in the reckoning? To understand we can look at another expression which says we are with which we are familiar, the one which says God destroys. In our study of God's character we have learned that God destroys by trying to save. Understanding how he goes about this work is the key. He comes to man with earnest desire to save him by opening to him every possible means of seeing and accepting the gospel. No honest and legitimate means is left untried in revealing to man something necessary for his salvation. But some people react negatively to God's saving efforts and begin to build a wall to hide themselves from what he is doing. Now, God is confirmed with another problem. He sees that if he continues to work for their salvation, these people will continue building this wall until they are finally shut, until they have finally shut him out altogether and thus destroyed themselves. But if he, out of concern for their self-destructive reactions, ceases his saving work, then they will still perish because they do not possess his salvation. If he chooses the latter course, he destroys them by not trying to save them. If he chooses the former course, he destroys them by trying to save them. So whatever God does, he can't win once people begin to set their hearts against the truth of God. Now, did you catch that principle? It's a very important one, that uh, when God seeks to save people, the more God works at it, the more people resist him. So if, if, if God goes on trying to save them, then they become hard in their resistance and thus destroy themselves. On the other hand, if God says, I'll give up trying to save them because of their reaction, then he would draw salvation from them and they perish, and they still perish. As the last sentence says, if he chooses the latter course, that is namely, 
ceasing his saving work, he destroys them by not trying to save them. If he chooses the former course, that is, uh, by uh, sending his life to them, he destroys them by trying to save them. The same is true when God says that he covers something. He covers things by trying to reveal them. He uses every legitimate means in his command to reveal the truth, but some people react negatively to God's revealing efforts and begin to hide themselves. And he sees that if he continues to, to if he continues his efforts to reveal, then they'll continue their efforts to hide and thus cover the truth from sight. But if out of concern for their covering reactions, he ceases his revealing work, then the truth will still be covered. If he chooses the latter course, he covers the truth by not trying to reveal it. If he chooses the former course, he covers the truth by trying to reveal it. And that's the way, of course, in which the truth was covered back in 1844. And so came the unfortunate great disappointment which should never have been. And so came the tremendous falling away which also should never have been when almost all the 50,000 people abandoned their faith and left the Adventist faith forever. As we read before, had that not taken place, had they accepted the light given to them and advanced them the truth of the, of the third angel's message, the work would very quickly have been finished and God's folk would have been home in the kingdom. Now this, so, and there would never have been a Laodicea in church, never. So we want now to understand what produced the Laodicea in church, what powerful factors which actually were present, which were, were an ongoing problem from the great disappointment produced the Laodicean condition in the church. Now, when we turn to volume one of the testimony, we find that um, message after message came through, through Sister White, they would have come through Hayes and Foss, but they came through her instead. And predominantly, Sister White talks about covetousness. It, it, it really stands out, covetousness, covetousness, covetous, covetousness all the way through. For instance, the very first testimony, number one, given in 1855, a mere 11 years after the Great Disappointment, is called Your Brother's Keeper. And this chapter deals with the um, disposition which is now developed for these folk to add house to house and land to land to build up a very broad basis of material security. I won't take time to read the chapter we've read it before, or at least take an extract from it. It talks about pride and exaltation coming in and people shackling themselves with the debts and building houses and lands and so on. <clears throat> and as you pass on to the succeeding pages, we have a chapter called Prepare to Meet Your God, the Rich Young Ruler, Conformity to the World, Wives of Ministers, Be Zealous and Repent, and so on. And always the sin which above all others is being condemned is covetousness. Covetousness in the form of adding house to house and land to land. Now, why doesn't Sister White talk about pride or, or carnality or um, some other sin? Why covetousness all the way through? Until in 1856, or no, 1857 I believe it to be. Let me just check the date of this testimony. I think it's 1857. It's testimony number three. It's quite a long testimony too, actually. Number three, 1857. That's 13 years after 1844. For the first time, Sister White was led to give a very clear and direct revelation to the Adventist people of the Laodicean message and to warn them that they were drifting into the Laodicean condition. I'd like to read one or two paragraphs from this chapter to establish the point I'm making in regard to this development. It says, page 141, Testimonies, Volume 1, the Lord has shown me in vision some things concerning the church in its present lukewarm state which I relate to you. The church was presented before me in vision, said the angel to the church, Jesus speaks to you, be zealous and repent. Obviously, of course, a direct reference to Revelation 3 and verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore and repent. <clears throat> Reading further, um, this work I saw should be taken hold of in earnest. There is something to repent of. Worldly mindedness, selfishness and covetous, covetousness have been eating out the spirituality and life of the church. So here we have these three very related problems. Worldly mindedness, selfishness and covetousness. Those three things are linked together in very close relationship. The danger of God's people for a few years past has been the love of the world. 
And out of this have sprung the sins of selfishness and covetousness. The more they get of this world, the more they set their affections upon it, and, and still they reach out for more, said the angel. It is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Yet many who profess to believe that we have, are having the last note of wound to the world are striving with all their energies to place themselves in a position where it is easier for a camel to go through the needle's eye than for them to enter the kingdom. Because we understand the needle's eye, the little tiny gate, that after dark gate through which a camel could not pass or a man could in the wall of the city of Jerusalem and stop the eye, eye of a little steel needle. Uh, and then once again the emphasis there of course is on selfishness and covetousness and um, the fact that it is easy for a camel to go through a needle's eye and for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. These earthly treasures are blessings when rightly used. Those who have them should realize that they are lent them of God and, should be cheerfully sp and they should cheerfully spend their means to advance his cause. They will not lose their reward here. They will be kindly regarded by the angels of God and will also lay up treasure in heaven. I saw as Satan watches the peculiar, selfish, covetous temperament of some who profess the truth and he will tempt them by throwing prosperity in their path, offering them the riches of earth. He knows that if they do not overcome their natural temperament, they will stumble and fall by loving mammon, worshipping their idol. Satan's of it is often accomplished. The strong love of the world overcomes or swallows up the love of the truth. The kingdoms of the world are offered them and they eagerly grasp the, their treasure and think they are wonderfully prospered. Satan triumphs because his plan has succeeded. They've given up the love of, the, of God for the love of the world. I saw that those who are thus prospered can thwart the design of Satan if they will overcome their selfish covetousness by laying all their possessions upon the altar of God. And when they see that where means are needed to advance the cause of truth and to help the widow, the fatherless and the afflicted, they should give cheerfully and thus lay up treasure in heaven. Heed the counsel of the true witness, buy gold tried in the fire, that you may be rich, white raiment that you may be clothed, and eyes so that you may see. Make some effort. These precious treasures will not drop upon us with some, without some exertion upon our part. We must buy, be zealous and repent of our lukewarm state. We must be awake to see our wrongs, to search for our sins and to zealously repent of them. And so it goes on. And once again the next page it talks about others of evil tempers, selfish covetousness to remove before they can open the door. And so I'm much impressed by the fact that the problem which arose subsequent to 1844 was covetousness which was, in Sister Wise's terms, the love of the world and of its treasures, the disposition to starve the work of God and to add house to house and land to land and to build up a material base of security. And the more they got, the more they wanted. Now, I ask myself the question, what is a psychology? What is the reason for that particular sin being the predominant problem at that point of time? One has but to go back a moment and do a little thinking to, to have a very obvious answer to this question. Now let's go back to 1844 and through being misinformed by their long-standing preconceived ideas and prejudices, the Adventist folk expected Jesus Christ to come October 22, 1844 and they were quite confident they'd be lifted from this earth and taken to heaven. Now, after October 22, 1844, what need did they have for further treasures upon this earth? Of food supplies, of houses, land, farms, and so forth? The answer is none. So, in harmony with their um, convictions, they sold everything and poured the money into the cause of God. They left their crops unharvested and so forth in the fields. And then came October 22, 1844. Their expectations were not realized and they suddenly found themselves unprepared for a bitter winter. And you can imagine the suffering they must have gone through in consequence of their sad mistake. Now you know that when, when, when you make a bad mistake in life and get your fingers badly burned, what are you apt not to do? Repeat that mistake. And um, it would become an extremely difficult thing for and it did become an extremely difficult thing for God then to to get those people to continue a work of self-sacrifice. Instead they said, look, we gave everything away once. We found ourselves without food, without housing, without land. We found ourselves destitute. With winter coming on, 
We know what it means to suffer for suffer hardship during a long cold winter with very little money and very little food and very little shelter and very little heat. And we're not apt to make that same kind of mistake again. We were fooled once, we shan't be fooled the second time. And so the reaction, the natural human reaction now is to take very, very good care not to be found in the same situation the second time, which involved, of course, their very careful accumulation of this world's goods. And no doubt you, you, you've seen this reaction in human beings from time to time. I remember, for instance, um, having contact with a widow down in Kentucky a number of years ago, and before her husband, her husband died, she went through years of, of great great want because her husband, so she said, and I believe it's to be quite true anyway, never ever gave her money, just gave her the barest, barest amount to buy food, never enough for that even, while he spent the money as he chose. And this woman found herself deprived of the normal comforts of life. She could never buy anything. When her husband died and she was released from that bondage, there was a, a, a reaction in the extreme on the other side. At that time on, everything that she'd laid her hands on, she could never, never, never um, part with. Um, I mean, she, she, she had accumulated a lot of junk and rubbish and, and good stuff and mixed up with bad stuff. I was never allowed inside a house, um, but I understand from those who had been in the house that you couldn't walk, you could just walk to the dome through a passage where you walk sideways, not straight, but you had to go through sideways, so, so, so you, 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 you were your narrowest. And you sort of sidled through floor to ceiling accumulations of uh, wares and goods and so forth. And she'd brought a couple of little dogs to our hours with the idea of bringing them to make money. But when the pups came on, she couldn't afford to, she couldn't bear to part with them. When their pups came and their pups came and their pups came, <laughs> you can imagine the situation. When I arrived there, there was 80 dogs in residence. <laughs> they were stacked in the house, out in the yard, everywhere you looked. And that poor woman had uh, reacted in the extreme to years of hardship and, and suffering. And I can see how the folk back in 1844 likewise reacted in the same way to their hardship and suffering and uh, it became almost a fetish with them to ensure that their goods and chattels were made secure to them and consequently we find that covetousness became their major problem. The acquirement of money, of lands, of houses, of, of, of material and earthly security and if they had faced another message telling them the Christ was coming in six months time they would not this time have sold their goods in preparation they'd have kept them just in case he didn't come they'd been caught once let's not be caught the second time can you begin to appreciate what their mental reaction were to their experience and with some experience they went through just imagine for instance you live in a northern state where the winters are extremely severe temperatures are way way down below zero with howling winds in the winter time and uh, Normally you had stopped a, a large amount of food for that time, wheat and corn and potatoes and whatnot, and there was a good food supply. You had gone out and stacked up a big stack of wood to keep the fire burning all night and day. But this, but this year, because you didn't expect to be in this world any longer, you didn't do that. And you had to face the world without food, without wood, without fuel. I tell you, you wouldn't forget that winter, would you, if you survived it. So in 1857, this plain message came to the Adventist people, and I'll leave you to, uh, to read the entire chapter. It begins on page 141 at your, in your own leisure. On page 144, we find Sister Wife speaking in very positive t terms in this light. She quotes the Laodicean, or from the Laodicean message, To him who overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his th throne. Then she says, we can overcome. Yes, fully entirely. Jesus died to make a way of escape for us and we might overcome every evil temper, every sin, every temptation and sit down at last with him. It is our privilege to have faith and salvation. The power of God is not, not decreased. His power, I saw, would be just as freely bestowed now as formerly. It is the church of God who have lost their faith and to claim their, their energy to wrestle as the Jacob saying, I'll not let you go except you bless me. Enduring faith has been dying away. It must be revived in the hearts of God's people. There must be a claiming of the blessing of God. Faith, living faith, always bears upward to God and glory, unbelief, downward to darkness and death. Now it's interesting to notice how positively Sister Wise spoke as early as 1857 to say that victory over sin is a possibility. We can overcome, yes, fully and entirely.
strong plain words aren't they now moving on we find that two years now go by and we come down to 1859 and during those two years testimony after testimony came through pleading with the people to turn from their sins and repent but apparently they did not do so then comes a chapter called the shaking which is repeated in the book of early writing which warned the church of a coming shaking in the church and dire consequences of those that didn't receive the message and then in 1859 came testimony number five and this is a very very powerful testimony the first paragraph describes sister white's own personal reaction to what to the failure on the part of the admin folk to respond to the previous warning given to the Laodicean church now I don't want you to get the impression that, that the church did not respond at all I used to have that impression myself but I've come to learn that there was a very commendable response which looked very promising and, and I think the church itself was quite satisfied and elated and confident that their response had been adequate but uh, Sister White viewed this response as being totally inadequate and was so disturbed by the low level of response that she became so desperately ill that she even thought she would not even wish to die let's read about this on page 185 volume 1 the testimonies she says the Lord has again visited me in great mercy I have been greatly afflicted for a few months past disease has pressed heavily upon me for years I have been afflicted with dropsy and disease of the heart which has had a tendency to depress my spirits and destroy my faith and courage. The message to lay the sins has not accomplished that zealous repentance to, among God's people which I expected to see and my perplexity of mine has been great. Disease seemed to, take, to make continual progress upon me and I thought that I must lie down in the grave. I had no desire to live therefore I could not take hold of faith and pray for my recovery. Often when I retired the rest of the night, I realized I was in danger of losing my breath before morning. In this state, I fainted at midnight. Brother Andrews and Loughborough were sent for and earnest petitions were offered to God on my behalf. The depression, the heavy weight was lifted from my aching heart and I was taken off in vision and shown the thing which I now present before you. Now this paragraph is worthy of some consideration, some meditation. First of all, Sister White describes a very, very serious state of illness and disease great afflictions he says for a few months past disease has pressed heavily upon me for years I have been afflicted with dropsy and disease of the heart which has had a tendency to depress my spirits and destroy my faith and courage now what caused this um, very serious condition of sickness in her at that point of time she explains why she said the message to the Laodiceans given back then testimony number three in 1857 has not accomplished that zealous repentance toward among God's people which I expected to see in my perplexity of mind has been great now when the message came to Sister White in the first case and she delivered it she was obviously filled with considerable optimism and confidence that the people of God would respond after all they were mighty fine people in many respects they were, they, they, they come through great experiences they were self-sacrificing to a degree or they wouldn't think so too much to read what we've read before but they, they were fine people if we met them today we'd say well then they're, they're quite nice folk and she expected though uh, first of all she saw with, with very great clarity the direction in which the church was going she saw the slide the apostasy and she saw that unless there was an arresting of this departure from God there would be dire consequences for the church of God and just as Daniel saw with anguish of spirit the prophecies revealed in Daniel chapter 8 and fainted because of it so Sister White was stricken because she did not see the repentance she knew was essential for the future prosperity of the Church of God now what a, what a tragedy of course that the uh, Church of that day was not able to see things as she saw them and I sometimes feel very disturbed myself and I ask myself the question do I today see myself do the believers see themselves that God would have us see ourselves we can rejoice of course that we've made wonderful progress we can rejoice that every year we are stepping onto higher ground and that is very encouraging and very essential and certainly safe to a certain point to a certain point of view but um, 
But I sometimes read statements in the spirit of prophecy, statements such as, if we are Christ, our sweetest thoughts will be of him. And I ask myself if that really true in my experience. Where I read statements which say that if we are Christ, we'll have the same burning burden for souls as he had, and so forth. I begin to wonder if uh, how blind I am in regard to my own personal condition. And certainly back there, the only living person upon this earth, and he really appreciated the desperate, desperate threat that was leveled at the church for Sister Wife herself, and she was so aware it made her, made her desperately ill. So ill that she was ready to die because of the concern that she felt at that point of time. Let's read these words again. Disease seemed to make continual progress upon me, and I thought I must lie down in the grave. I had no desire to live, therefore I could not take hold of faith and pray for my recovery. Often when I retired to rest at night, I realized I was in danger of losing my breath before morning. In this state I fainted at midnight. Now that's, that, that sickness was a direct result of her anguish of spirit, of her, of her awareness of the desperate plight in the church, and uh, how things were going from bad to worse in the church. Now today, of course, the church is far worse than it was back there. And as we... As we look upon it, um, even those of us who are outside of the church and have found a new life in this message, we don't realise the true condition of the church at all. We don't even begin to. And uh, if it's conditioned, because it's conditioned, they must be worse than it was in Sister Weister. That's, that's self-evident. At least back there they were standing by the legalistic principle, which today, of course, are virtually completely gone. Now, if today the members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church could have their eyes open to see as Sister White could see, would we find the same anguish of spirit? Absolutely. Would we find people becoming sick because of their spiritual anxiety? Most certainly we would be. Would we hear agonizing prayers putting before God? We certainly would be. We'd hear those things. But we don't, of course, because the blindness is even worse today than it was back at that point of time. And so the brethren were called, it came, came to a crisis point, the brethren were called, uh, Andrews and Loughborough, and earnest petitions were offered to, to God on my behalf. The depression, the heavy weight was lifted from my aching heart, and I was taken off in vision and shown the thing which I now present before you. Now here are those things that Sister White saw, which we'll spend some time studying. I saw that Satan had been trying to drive me to discouragement and despair, to make me desire death rather than life. I was shown that it was not God's will that I should now cease from the work and lie down in the grave, for then the enemies of our faith would triumph and the hearts of God's children would be made sad. I saw that I should often feel anguish of spirit and should suffer much, yet I had the promise that those around me would encourage and help me, that my courage and strength might not fail while I was so fiercely buffeted by the, enemy, by the devil. So this is what was very plainly shown the necessity for her to remain alive in order to continue to witness to the church at that time. When I mentioned last night, or was it out in the Quebec camp meeting, maybe I did mention here last night too, that uh, I don't envy for one moment the ministry of Sister White had to perform. And I don't envy Jeremiah's ministry either because they had to minister to a people who wouldn't listen, a people that um, with their mouths they revered the cause of God but they didn't practice what they professed to believe in. Let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 33, I think it is, and uh, note the word of God to the prophet Ezekiel, which is parallel to the situation we're reading about here in the testimonies in regard to the Adventist church back there. Ezekiel, as I think it's chapter 33, starting with verse 30, that's correct. Ezekiel 33, verse 30 to 34, and God said to the prophet also thou son of man the children of thy people still are talking against you by the walls and the doors of the houses and speak one to another every one to his brother saying come I pray you and hear what is the word that comes from forth from the Lord and they come unto you as the people come and they sit before you as my people and they hear your words, but they will not do them. For their mouths they show much love, but their heart goes after their covetousness. And lo, you are unto them as a very lovely song of one who has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument, but they hear your words, but they do not do them. 
and when this comes to pass and Lord will come then shall they know the prophet has been amongst them and what a, what a, what a, what a frustrating picture for a or situation for a prophet to face God gives him a message he faithfully gives the message he knows the future of the church hangs upon the reception of that message but the people say yes we love these words we, we, we like to hear them but they don't do a single thing about them now is that an encouraging life for a prophet to lead it's very depressing it's most discouraging and so it's so seriously discouraging that in the case of sister white it almost took her life and would have taken her life had not got intervened and and given her restoration of health again in response to the prayers of the brethren now let's look now at the message on page 186 in the book volume one the testimonies I was shown that the testimony of the latest sins applies to God's people at the present time and the reason it has not accomplished a greater work is because of the hardness of their hearts but, God's given, but God has given the message time to do its work the heart must be purified from sin which have so long shut out Jesus this fearful message will do its work when it was first presented it led to close examination of heart now I was quite impressed when I read this because as I said before when, when, I, when I with less thoroughness had read these chapters some years ago I had the impression that the, that the Laodicean people had not done anything about the call of God to them but we find they did a, a lot about the call of God to them there was a very remarkable repentance but not sufficient to, to satisfy the needs of the hour let me read a little further now it says um, when it was first presented that was back in 1857 two years before I read, that, read from page 141 a moment ago in testimony number three in volume one of course when it was first presented back in 1857 it led to close examination of hearts now this, doesn't that sound good? surely sins were confessed and the people of God were stirred everywhere nearly all believed this message would end in the loud cry of the third angel but as they there's, a, there's an unfortunate word but which brings in a contrast a new picture but as they failed to see the powerful work accomplished in a short time many lost the effect of the message I saw that this message would not accomplish its work in a few short months it's designed to arouse the people of God to discover to them their backsliding and to lead to zealous repentance that they may be favoured with, with the presence of Jesus and fitted for the loud cry of the third angel now I'll just mention this point now and emphasise it more later what does the latter sin message prepare us for? the loud cry what does the loud cry prepare us for? translation as, as we shall learn and what does Jacob's trouble prepare us for? the doing of the final work by which of course the rebellion can be ended and Jesus Christ come again the second time so keep in mind then that the latter of sin message prepares us for what? the loud cry, the latter rain and loud cry and the latter rain prepares us for what? translation and Jacob's trouble for that perfection required to finish the final work we'll have a study on that later in the series as the message, as this message affected the heart it led to deep humility before God deep humility um, lost my place at the moment um, right angels were sent in every direction to prepare unbelieving hearts for the truth the cause of God began to rise and his people were acquainted with their position if the counsel of the true witness had been fully heeded God would have wrought for his people in greater power yet the efforts made since the message has been given have been blessed of God and many souls have been brought from error and darkness to rejoice in the truth so without question the presentation of the Laodicean message back in 1857 did produce a very deep and wonderful uh, repentance and uh, improvement in the experience of the Laodicean people but the fault lay in the fact the good beginning was not uh, followed through with a continuation of this experience now there's always been the trouble with the church of God good beginnings and then of course a fading away of that good beginning let's remind ourselves of Hebrews the fourth chapter and verse one again where Paul says wherefore holy brethren partakers of the heavenly calling let us fear lest they promise being left us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of it Hebrews chapter four verse one let us therefore fear 
lest they promise being left us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of it now what does that infer coming short does it deny a good beginning not at all it infers a good beginning and what does history demonstrate about the church it's always made a good beginning never failed to with great dedication and uh, even spectacular events the church has been launched upon its course and uh, God has wrought mightily for his people but it hasn't been very long before for various reasons the church turns aside from implicit obedience from doing God's work God's way to doing God or trying to do God's work man's way as you learn in the Sabbath rest message of course as soon as that begins to take place then a separation begins to develop between Christ and his people and that separation of course results in finally in divorce when Christ is forced to seek another movement to take the place of those who have gone their own stubborn way and in 1844 when the lay of the sin message came it did produce a good beginning let's not overlook that fact let me read some of the the cardinal or the chief words again to make that point very clear it said led to close examination of heart sins were confessed and the people of God was stirred everywhere it led to deep humility at that point of time but when they found the work did, when the message did not accomplish a short work then they lost the effect of it and they sank back into their later sin condition one more, once again and when they did they, have, they never ever have recovered from that sense and, and God had to wait until he called individuals as he's doing at the present time to return to the true Philadelphian experience what a tragedy this history is as we see what might have been but of course that which in fact was not because of this drifting away from the commands and work of God now no doubt those people thought that their deep humility their earnest repentance and so forth was all that God required but when in 1859 a second witness came from the true witness telling them that they were still very much in the land of sin condition that there was still need for a very deep and zealous work to do they should have said to, said to themselves what well, if the true witness says it it must be true we don't measure up yet let's really go to work and enter into a deeper experience and let's make this work so thorough so complete that God will be pleased with us and he can finish his work in our hearts they know they had by this time the book um, no they didn't have book, the book of the writings yet but they certainly had had the testimonies from Sister White which pointed out that before before 1844 they were approved of God accepted of him that God looked upon with pleasure and so forth well time has gone again I see um, every year 45 minutes gets shorter and shorter doesn't it so let's leave it there and we'll pick up the steam again we come back in our three o'clock study period this afternoon any questions you'd like to ask before we have our closing hymn?